welcome. This is Canonical, the podcast that takes literature out of the classroom. What does that mean to take literature out of the classroom? Is that a good thing? Throw it out. Burn those books. Oh, okay. Fuck classrooms. I'm James Shell, and with me are my co-hosts, Iad Darris and Sam Spieler. Yo. Hey. Today we are wrapping up our series, Rich Country, Poor Country, by discussing all three books that we've read. The Disaster Tourist by Yun Ka Un, The Sympathizer by Viet Van Nguyen, and Paradise by Abdul Razak Gurna. Next week, we'll start a new series exploring novels about communism, beginning with The Passport by Erta Mueller. If you would like to chat with us, you can find us on social media at CanonicalPod and on Reddit at our Canonical Pod. So I started this series and I was interested in these novels because. I want to think more about personal encounters between people from rich countries and poor countries. In these three novels, the encounters that we saw were not always personal. Sometimes they were, though. So do these novels show us anything about how the encounter might vary at a personal level as opposed to a social level? Can you explain what you mean by those differences? Well, a personal level is you going to Mexico and meeting a poor Mexican. And a social level would be your country setting up a kind of puppet government in a foreign country where it's not a one-to-one thing, but more of a societal conflict or a social influence that one country has on the other. In The Sympathizer, it's a bit tough to look at it seriously because so much of it is kind of like a cartoonish depiction of the other. The other, in this case, being the white American. For example, the department head. He has a personal encounter with the protagonist, but Can we read that much into this personal encounter when the narrator is obviously skewering this character? I think what it shows us is not necessarily how the character, the protagonist of The Sympathizer, feels about that particular person or how that particular person feels about white Americans, but rather the ridiculousness that minorities may view white America in general with. Like, I think that there is humor to be found in minority places on the internet where they make fun of white people and white culture. I'm thinking here like how white people don't season their food. That's something that a lot of minorities make fun of white people for online. You know, that particular encounter kind of clues you into that. The sympathizer seems like the the odd man out in this case, not just because of that, but also because while he is supposed to be this singular character, we talked in at least one of those episodes about how he's kind of this every man and no man at the same time, that he's kind of a stand in for either refugees or Vietnamese people or even just any given minority group in the U.S., that gets overlooked. But the other books seem like they're much more specific in character interactions or culture interactions. What about the difference between the interaction between Yona and Luck in The Disaster Tourist and their romance and the relationship between the protagonist and Miss Mori in The Sympathizer? Do you think one was more successful or nuanced? I would say yes. I would say the interactions between the protagonist of The Sympathizer, his interactions with Miss Mori and with Lana are both more nuanced than between Yuna and Luck. With Yuna and Luck, we don't really see what interest they have in each other other than that they're there and that there's this maybe urgency with Paul and the downfall of Mui. But that's kind of all I get from their relationship. 
The difficulty there is we don't know how real that relationship is because it has that extra layer of the manuscript where this could have been a scripted story, an unreal story in the story. Oh, man. I mean, you can take it at face value and say it was an actual romance and that's how it really turned out. But I mean, I don't think you can discount the fact that at the end, you know, I mean, you have a script writer saying we need romance in the story or whatever, like he actually says it. And then the end of the book is about like someone recovering these pages and you know, making it into a story to boost the tourism. I will admit that that didn't even occur to me. And if that had been played up more, I would have been much more interested. More or less. It was too in between. I think at the social level, at the level of institutions kind of battling each other, it's easier to see how power is involved and manipulation is involved. But I think it's more difficult to see the power imbalance when we have the one-on-one -on -one interactions. And I think that's what Nguyen is really trying to focus on in The Sympathizer. Because he is so politically minded, I think he wants to show us that as much as possible, because that's more hidden. What about with Paradise, though? Paradise feels maybe in between those two. In that we see through Yusuf's eyes... He is kind of this retelling, as we talked about before, but he's a little bit more than that. He's more of his own character in that he exists in this pre-colonial into colonial era Tanzania, where he's running up against the culture clashes between the Arabs and the Africans, but also these incoming Germans. It's personal, but it's also a social level. I think that that's different for us as readers because we situate ourselves in the middle. We don't always know who to root for. In the conflict between the Africans and the Arabs, we haven't been socialized the way we have to root for one party over the other. I think when we read The Sympathizer and we see him making fun of white Americans or criticizing white America's politics, we know that we're supposed to be on his side. Is that all it comes down to, though, is sides? I think that, at least with Nguyen, there is a side. Yeah. Like, if you side with America... If you side with Claude, if you side with those values, you're not getting the message that I think Nguyen wants you to get. But with Guruna, I don't know how much it is about sides. I think with Yusuf, he's such a, I don't want to say vacant character, because I think he does have a perspective, sort of, but it's a very light touch. It focuses more on the observation rather than on his perspective as a character. And as such, it's not just that we don't know who to root for. It's that we're kind of seeing this window into history and just watching things happen rather than wanting one thing or another to happen. If I make the claim that Paradise largely deals with the personal and not the societal, would you disagree? I think I would a little bit. That's rare. Um, <laughs> I never disagree, huh? Not with James, at least. Let's compare it a little bit to uh, The Disaster Tourist, where Yuna feels to me like a very specific character. This is a unique character, not based on anything else. And we're seeing other characters that are supposed to be real people. With Paradise... I feel like that's true of most of the characters, except maybe for Yusuf, that Yusuf is kind of this weird in-between of real character and stand-in. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that we see Aziz as an example of Arabs, and we see other characters as examples of that particular kind of person. Is that kind of what you were asking? Like, How do you see it, James? I think that compared with the overt social commentary of the sympathizer paradise seems to focus on personal relationships because that's how the book is structured from beginning to end 
you know, he meets Aziz, he's with his parents, and then he forms a friendship with Khalil. So he has these personal encounters and forges these bonds with these other characters over the course of the story. It's very different in my mind to The Sympathizer, where it's obvious that it's societal commentary. In Paradise, I don't see that. I think it's much more nuanced, and it feels like what a personal relationship is like, because personal relationships are more nuanced. It's rarely, this is good and this is bad. His relationship with Aziz, for example, is very nuanced. It feels like a personal relationship rather than a societal commentary. I think that's true. I don't think that it's a difference of intention, though. I think it's a difference if I'm honest, in skill. I think that Gurna is the superior novelist, and Gurna knows how to show us the political through the personal. With Nguyen, it's just so obvious that he has a political bent. So in all three of the books that we read for this series, The Disaster Tourist, The Sympathizer, and Paradise, we see violence as a tool that's used by richer countries. In these books, how else do rich countries exert their influence on the poorer countries? I think the clearest one is money, right? I mean, not just by the expected quality that we have in the title, rich country, poor country, but I think that's the biggest way the rich countries exploit the poorer countries. Not just in terms of like tourism, as you get in The Disaster Tourist, but also the flexibility for example, in The Sympathizer, it's not just the violence, it's that the U.S. can pull out of Vietnam and wipe their hands of it. And even if there are stakes for them, it's more of a political, social, or, or um, historical importance rather than something that is felt on the ground. The U.S. doesn't immediately feel any effects by pulling out, and they certainly don't feel effects at home by being in Vietnam, at least not the kinds of effects that Vietnam feels. Richer countries have the opportunity to establish for the world what is considered a good life, what's considered normal, even though the protagonist of The Sympathizer is very critical. He enjoys many aspects of his life in the U.S., and he enjoys many of the things that are available to him in the U.S. that are not available in Vietnam. I think we kind of see that in paradise. If we see the richer country, in this case, I guess the Arabs, enjoying an easier life than the people of the, what, what do they call them? They're the Swahili people, but they're like people in the mountains, not the people of the coast, right? So the people in the mountains seem to be rather impoverished, whereas the Arab traders on the coast seem to be well-to-do. And you have the sense that even though he's an indentured servant, his life is better on the coast as an indentured servant. When the Germans come in in Chatu's village, is it just strength that is strength and, and threat of violence that convinces them to relinquish the goods? Or is there something else? I think it's mainly strength, but there is also the mystique or the mythology that we talked about in the last episode, where people of that area believe Germans to be somehow supernatural. The idea of security that is offered by the German presence is also very attractive in one way. And it creates a vacuum that people are very happy to have the Germans fill, where people like Aziz are constantly under this threat of having their stuff taken away from them. And if it comes down to being subservient to the Germans in order to keep their stuff, I think a lot of people would be willing to take that bargain. As long as there's order, as long as they get to continue living in the lifestyle they're accustomed to that it's okay to serve another master. Well, it just reminds me of something I talked about in the review episode, which is the most interesting part of this book for me, 
is how at the beginning it seems like they were living in a stateless society and near the end it seems to be moving toward this kind of colonial government and this allure of order that comes with it whereas at the beginning you don't have this kind of order things are done almost piecemeal you know these bargains are struck on a personal level individually and you don't have this sense of security that Yad was talking about. What about the difference between state violence that we see in The Sympathizer and Paradise and this kind of corporate control that we see in The Disaster Tourist? Is that a separate thing or is it just kind of a different instance of the same kind of power? Do we know where Paul is based? I don't think we know that, but I think it would be a safe guess to assume that it's not a company from Mui. Yeah, I think I mentioned in one of those episodes that I expected the reveal to be that Paul owned Jungle, that it was all one and the same. But that never happens, at least not on the page. The interesting thing for me, as someone who's interested in history, is that because Paradise is about German colonialism in Africa and not British or Dutch colonialism, the British and the Dutch and other European countries, especially the Northern European countries, they established companies like the East Indian Company, West Indian Company, that kind of stuff. And that relationship between corporate and state is intertwined. But I don't think that was the case in the German colonization of Africa. I think then that Paul could be seen as an evolution of that because, you know, these companies existed in one respect to insulate the foreign country's government from whatever abuses the country suffered, whatever abuses the uh, the company was inflicting upon this poor country. Paul, I don't think, serves any particular country. It serves itself. So rather than you know, the Dutch East India Company, it kind of morphs into the Paul Mui Company that serves Paul rather than serving Holland or wherever else. So then that ends up being more of a statement on capitalism, global capitalism, than it does the interactions between rich and poor countries. I mean, that's there too, but it's not just that a rich country like Korea is exploiting a poorer country like Mui or Vietnam, but it feels like it's exploitative on another level, that it's pushing the issue away from Korea and saying it's not just Korea, it's also a global issue. I mean, theoretically, countries remain accountable to the United Nations and International Court of Justice, right? That's a good one. But a country can be held accountable. But what about Paul? Who is Paul accountable to? They're supposed to be accountable to wherever they're recognized as their like home country. But I don't know. Somebody else might say shareholders, but then you'd have to ask, well, do the shareholders really care? Probably not. Do these books offer a way of resisting this influence from a richer country or this influence from a foreign corporation? Maybe homogeneity. Like in The Sympathizer, one of the points that gets brought up, it's kind of thrown away as a joke in the Hollywood movie that anyone and everyone could be Viet Cong. But that becomes almost a truism that anyone could be radicalized. Anyone could be pushed into seeing just how poorly they've been treated by Western powers or by the previous people in charge. And if they get radicalized, maybe they can push out the foreigners. Also in The, the Sympathizer, it's not just this feeling of altogetherness, but they have philosophy on their side. They can philosophize the problem. And through this philosophy of communism and hopefully a better life, they can push out the foreigners. It's very tough for me to separate that from Nguyen himself, because I think in the novel, you're right that, you know, Marxism is the thing that they can use to resist this influence. 
But Nguyen, I think, on his own, has perhaps writing. That's his way of resisting this influence. And I think he believes very strongly in that. He is very interested in the power of rhetoric. I think you could see the sympathizer as perhaps advocating for violence via revolution as a way of resisting. But at the end of the book, you see the beginning of what seems to be like never-ending purges as a way of using violence to remove the influence of these more powerful capitalistic countries. So it seems that violence can give you some resistance, but it just doesn't end because it, it cannot solve the problem in its entirety. I, I actually think there's a lot to talk about with this. Because I think it is one of the more important questions of this series, which is these three novels are all told from the point of view of the weaker people in this relationship. Mm. Despite the fact that Gurna is an Arab, he's telling the story from the point of view of the Swahili. What about Yona? Yeah, I don't know if that... Well, yes, but at the same time, the story takes the point of view of the was that the Mui, right? She becomes kind of an honorary Mui. Like she sympathizes with them. She wants to resist the colonial aspects of Paul, the colonialism that's happening with the tourism industry. I mean, yeah, she begins as a person who is privileged, but by the end, I don't think you would say that she belongs with them anymore especially because she can't leave the country. She doesn't have her passport, right? It's rather symbolic that she loses her passport and she loses her national identity. That's true to an extent, but I am more dubious about the perspective of the disadvantage coming through through these novels. Reason being, Yoon ko is Korean. She's from a wealthy country. And Gurna has lived much more of his life in Britain than he ever lived in Tanzania. Well, he is, you know, of course, originally from there, you may have the sense that he no longer can speak to the same issues that they do. And similarly for Nguyen, he left Vietnam when he was very young, and his experience as a minority in America is distinct from the experience of somebody who still lives in Vietnam. You know, I think their intentions are to represent the other or to represent the downtrodden. But are these people really able to do it? I actually think that's an interesting question because in all three books, the writer is from the more privileged country. But I would say the book itself, the protagonist in the book, are sympathizers or representative of the disadvantaged people. So it, it does add that extra layer. Because then you have to ask, well, I mean, is anything they say that relevant? If the writers themselves are privileged, can they really speak for these people? I have two minds here because it would be one thing if there were people that were coming out and saying, hey, you don't speak for us. But I guess that's also part of the problem is that if they aren't being represented, then there's no one to say, hey, you don't speak for us. I really think we can talk about this at length. There's just a lot of different angles toward it, but I don't think we'll reach any conclusion because we can't solve this problem of colonialism and post-colonialism. Shucks. I thought this was the podcast to do it. <laughs> Three middle-aged dudes solve colonialism. I want to talk about something that Nguyen himself said. Boring. Uh, you know, James, you say that after every time I, I bring up a subject. <laughs> You might get the hint. <laughs> oh, I've got it. I've got it. In this case, I am bored per my comment. Um, we discussed, I believe we discussed this article before, but in the New York Times, Viet Tan Nguyen has an article entitled Viet Tan Nguyen Reveals How Writers' Workshops Can Be Hostile. In that article, he argues that the revered Maxim show Don't Tell is not actually as universal as the American Writers Workshop Institution wants us to believe. That it is, in fact, more in line with white male writers, not necessarily for women or people of color. 
is it an argument if he puts forward the statement but does not support it in any way? <laughs> well, let's talk about it. Does he support it in any way that you could see? Well, he says it a few times. He claims that other writers say the same, but he doesn't actually qualify that with what they've said, just that they've also asserted those claims. He's saying that the, the workshops themselves are suspect. If you're talking specifically about show, don't tell being bunk, I think what he's trying to back that up with is the fact that there is a certain kind of writing that is embodied with that advice. And that writing is more or less apolitical. It's more or less about personal private experience and personal voices. He mentions in the article that this could be connected to a kind of anti-communist stance in the U.S. that was trying to push art towards that apolitical realm rather than towards a more politically confrontational realm. To me, that's the more generalized idea of the workshop, and I kind of understand that. But I'm just interested, at least right now, with the idea of show, don't tell. Because he seems to point that as a specific thing that he has a problem with. But I'm wondering if that's even a problem for these books that we read. My take is that in The Disaster Tourist, I think she does have a problem with that. She doesn't do a very good job of showing. She kind of just gives us what's going on. It feels more plot-based than anything else. But I don't know that that's true in The Sympathizer or in Paradise. I don't think there's a problem with telling in those books. So then you agree with him. Yeah, I come at it from a totally different angle. I mean, why is show don't tell apolitical? If you read Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood, she's showing, she's not telling. You have to interpret the book, but it is obviously political. In the book, she's not lecturing you like Nguyen does in his book. Well, I agree, but I also don't think he's just telling. And maybe I understand show, don't tell as something a little bit different. No, I'm saying his claim, yeah, the way you understand his claim, that show, don't tell is apolitical. What I'm saying is, why is it apolitical? How does that make sense? I just totally disagree with that. I think there are tons of books that are political that show and don't tell, that don't lecture you. I think the reason is not that it is apolitical, but that it leans apolitical because it emphasizes the lived experience rather than the conceptualization of injustice that we might get if we would speak directly towards the concepts of right and wrong and justice and those sorts of things that we get much more in The Sympathizer than we get in a lot of other books that also do have a political message, but focus more on the experience of injustice rather than talking about it directly. It feels like just as much of an issue of political versus apolitical that it might just also be an issue of the, the types of people you encounter in those workshops. So maybe he was rubbing against the wrong people because they didn't have these kinds of aspirations. They didn't have those experiences. He says that it's more about lived experiences, and yet he's writing to something that I'm guessing most people can't. I mean, my question is, is it possible to have multiple ways to speak truth to power in a novel? Do you have to be confrontational? Because it seems like that's what he's saying. It's like, if you show, don't tell, you're avoiding confrontation because you're allowing room for interpretation. And once again, because he doesn't actually argue his point, we have to speculate here. I mean, this is how I am understanding his point. If he were to grace us with his point and tell us exactly how show, don't tell results in these problems, I'd be much more receptive to it. But my sense is that there are other ways to speak truth to power besides being overtly confrontational when you're dealing with a genre of fiction. I think it's too limiting to say that the only way to decolonize literature is to preach and to lecture, right? To tell. It seems to me that that's a very narrow-minded way of understanding how literature works and how people are persuaded. I think he's operating from a way of understanding literature that's very empty. And I think it seems empty to him 
because it's very difficult to define what makes a novel good. And because we can't come up with any hard and fast rules about this is what a writer should do and this is what a writer shouldn't do, I think what he is saying is that there are no rules and there is nothing to be learned about the craft of fiction, which I think is just untrue. The craft of fiction still exists, and I think that show, don't tell is still good advice because what it offers us is subtlety and indeterminacy. And even though we don't know for sure that those are valuable to every reader, I think most readers do value those things. When we start telling people, we lose those things. So my question would be, if we're willing to lose those things, what do we gain? I think what we potentially gain is access to a dumber reader, because the less introspective, less intelligence might not even come to it, but the reader who is more critically analytical might miss a book that's more subtle, whereas a reader who is not might read one of those lectures in The Sympathizer and say, yeah, that's right. Like, he's totally right. You know, and then he gains that kind of understanding from a reader that maybe isn't looking for nuance. What about Gurna and his protagonist, Yusuf? Don't you think that we experience what that novel has to offer us through Yusuf very differently from the way that Nguyen's protagonist is presented to us in The Sympathizer? For me, I would say that Paradise is more of the guided discovery, whereas The Sympathizer is more or less dogma. Is one more persuasive than the other? I might say, if I were channeling Nguyen, that the problem with Paradise is it's too vague, where you don't exactly understand what Gurna wants you to take from the book, which is, I think, Nguyen's point. Like, when he wants people to tell. You know, I think, from his point of view, if you leave that book not really understanding the ideas, especially as pertaining to decolonizing writing in some fashion, then you have failed in your endeavor. But once again, I'm, I'm interpreting what he's saying, because he does not explicitly say it. I think that's true. But I think that, well, you may take away less of the book because it's not clear what the message is. When the message is really obvious, that may incline readers to stop reading. For example, here I'm thinking a parable of the sower. I thought that that book was very obvious. And because it was so obvious, I would be more inclined to stop reading than I would reading Paradise. Paradise was compelling because it was more subtle, because it wasn't so obvious. I feel like that is a subjective matter, though. Like, I get what you're saying, and I almost want to agree, but... But I'm not James. It... <laughs> With you, he almost agrees. With me, he agrees a little bit. Well, <laughs> so which is better? It That just feels subjective in a way that... Um, I, I want to give Nguyen both more and less credit than I think he deserves because I, I understand because you're of two minds, I'm of two minds, <laughs> just like the sympathizer on one mind, more credit with the other mind, less credit because he seems like he doesn't want this to be a subjective matter. He seems like he wants, and again, I'm kind of making guesses at what he means. <sighs> I don't really know what he's trying to say because I, I don't feel like it's a monolithic thing. There's maybe a claim of objectivity to what makes good writing, but it's not like they all get together independently and decide who gets in and who doesn't or who gets published and who doesn't. That's a separate issue. I will give him the credit that you want to give him. I will say that there are a lot of writers or a lot of people 
and experiences that are being shut out of the workshop experience. Maybe not deliberately, but they see what it is and they say, oh, well, this is not for me. And that, I think, is wrong because I think that if those people want to tell stories, they should feel empowered to do it. But I think the things that are shutting them out are not the things that Thuin is talking about. What is it that's shutting them out then? Is it a self-selecting sort of thing? I think really the thing that shuts them out is so fundamental that it's not even talking about fiction anymore. The biggest thing that shuts them out is that the craft of fiction is always happening at the college level. So many people are not going to college. They don't get to learn about the craft of fiction because it's held behind closed doors. Yes and no. I mean, I, in one of my years where I was not going to school, in between school years, I went to a community college that offered like a very cheap creative writing course. And the people who attended were not college students. Most of them were retirees who were trying to write their memoirs. Um, Very dull stuff. But there are resources available, though the vast majority of young writers do attend some form of creative writing workshop. I mean, I think the problems with homogeneity are true, but they're true if, and this sounds pejorative, but I'm not trying to be pejorative, if you are a weak-minded writer. Because what's the one thing that writers hear all the time in creative writing workshops? And of course, Sam, you and I have gone through creative writing programs. It's to find your reader. I've heard that so many times from different teachers. Not everyone is your reader. You will get people in your workshop who tell you your work is terrible, but maybe they're not your reader. You have to find people who read you and understand you and know what you're going for. That's the goal of a creative writing workshop. It's to make these connections and to find your voice. When I say you're weak-minded, the people who are dissuaded from what they want to write about, the problem is that they're so easily dissuaded, they're not going to succeed as a writer. Because as a writer, you're going to fail all the time. Like, editors will reject you all the time. If you're letting, like, five randos in a creative writing workshop tell you your work is terrible and you quit, you're not going to make it as a writer. So this is why I don't buy into this homogeneity argument, because if you have a distinct voice and people aren't getting it and you quit, you're probably not going to make it anyway because you let those guys tell you to quit. Do you think there's something that the workshops could do that would make someone like Nguyen happy? I'll say this saying that I actually liked his book, like The Sympathizer. I liked his book and I liked Nguyen, but I think if you take the stance that everything you're fighting against is all around you, that you have to be adversarial, and you can see that from his book, then you're going to take that attitude in all directions. And so I would say no. (laughs) Like, I don't think there will be a mainstream creative writing workshop that he will be satisfied with. And the thing is, I actually quite sympathize with a lot of these arguments. Pun intended, I agree that literature should be, quote, decolonized, that there should be more voices and all that stuff. But I don't think the workshop is the problem. I think that if you take the attitude that this is all rotten, let's tear it all down, what are you going to build up then? Like, it's much easier to criticize. It's much harder to say, well, instead of a creative writing workshop, we should have what? Like, what? what is he advocating for? That's really my issue. I wonder if there is something more to the point that the workshop is kind of in service to the market. So if publishers were publishing a different sort of novel, especially literary fiction, Maybe he has more of a point if he's saying the industry needs to be better about recognizing different voices. Oh, that's not true at all. I mean, you look at these books that we've read, Colson Whitehead, Tommy Orange, even Nguyen himself. In the last decade, these are three writers of color writing very politically conscious works, and they're all Pulitzer Prize winners. Hmm. These people are being recognized, and maybe his point is that they should be even more recognized. But that, to me, I think it still it rests on something way larger than the writing workshop. All right, we'll stop here. Thank you for listening. 
if you'd like to chat with us, we are on Reddit at our canonical pod and on social media at canonical pod. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can give us a nice review on Apple or your podcast platform of choice. Next week, we'll be back with a review of The Passport by Erta Mueller. We'll also be starting a new series on literature from communist countries. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.